this is one of those topics that um, is quite important to know, just, just not just for exams, but just in terms of clinical practice as well. So let's talk a bit more about what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a lot. Uh, the first bit will be all about HIV and AIDS. Um, how you test for it, uh, when you start treatment and things like that. Um, then we'll move on to a bit more gum sort of stuff. So vaginal discharge, candiasis, ulcers, um, syphilis and PID as well. Uh, I just want to start by mentioning right from the get-go, I'm not going to talk about the specifics of about the uh, different types of antiretroviral therapy because that's um, quite a niche sort of subject and it's not really suitable for undergraduate level starting off prep or the interpreting of syphilis serology just because it's quite controversial all right um, so as per usual let's start with a question so we'll give about a minute or so yeah About 10 seconds left. Okay, let's see what people thought the answer was. Okay, so it looks like 44% of people um, thought it was option A, some, some closely followed by option C. And nobody really went for therapeutic lumbar puncture. Perfect, okay, fine. Um, so let's just go through the correct answer, which is actually option A. So commencing uh, CART and whole brain irradiation. Let's talk a bit about the other options first. So the uh, option B, uh, some of you who attended the talk on Tuesday would remember that this is a treatment for uh, cerebral toxoplasmosis. So that's possible, but you probably have someone who has, um, the symptoms will come on a bit more quickly. So not so much over two months, could be over bit more in the order of weeks instead. They may have a bit more focal neurological signs as well. And I think most importantly, when you scan, when you do a scan of the brain, you'll get multiple focal, um, multiple focal enhancing lesions, which is not in keeping with this um, patient's uh, condition. Um, option C, the um, second most popular option, that's the treatment for cryptococcal meningitis. Um, typically, it is possible, you can get a sort of subacute kind of um, presentation, but they tend to have a bit more fever, headache, a bit more, a bit of fatigue as well. Um, the CT brain and the, um, the CT brain is usually clear, so that's not really in keeping what, with what this patient have, has. Uh, again, cyclovir is treatment for CMV meningitis. Uh, Therapeutic lumbar puncture is just for, just for you to diagnose meningitis, really. So what this patient actually has is actually a CNS, primary lymphoma. And the best treatment for that, and, that, and that's when you get patients with about a subacute, I'm sorry, about two-month history, personality change, a bit of, um, a bit of um, vague symptoms, really. And the best way to treat it is with um, whole brain irradiation or methotrexate chemotherapy. Okay. Um, let's go on to another question and we'll talk a bit more about the other um, AIDS defining illness. So we'll give you this another sort of a minute or so, yeah?
another 10 seconds. Okay, and time's up. Let's see what people thought was the most likely organism. Okay, so great. Okay, so it's the most popular options are options C and D. Okay, so PCP and strep pneumo. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about the correct, so let's see the correct answer first and talk through it, yeah? So the correct answer is actually option D, streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, um, this is, this is an annoying question, isn't it? It's basically telling you a HIV patient with pneumonia um, and it's got signs of, and you almost certainly would pick PCP. Now, the reason why that's not correct in this case is because this patient has um, a normal CD4 count. He's got a viral load that's not detected, which basically means that he's, his immune system is similar to yours and mine. Which, be, which then means that he's susceptible to the same sort of organisms that would uh, cause his pneumonia in the first place. And PCP doesn't really happen in people with CD4 counts of um, uh, more than 200. Okay, sorry, so a bit annoying that one, yeah. Okay, so the take home message is, so I quite like, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a summary slide talking about all the different levels of your CD4 count and, and what sort of opportunistic infections you can get at that point. So less than 200, you get PCP, candidiasis. Uh, less than 100, you get cryptococcal meningitis. Less than 50, you get the uh, toxoplasmosis, CMV, retinitis. And of note, it's quite important to realize that you can get TB at any level, really. Okay, fine. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit more about the different sorts of um, opportunistic infections, starting with the respiratory system. So PCP is actually, or oh, pneumocystis gyrovechi, is a fungus. Uh, it occurs when you have CD4 count less than 200. And the main symptoms that patient has I will complain of is just breathlessness. It's not so much the cough, it's not so much the fever or chest pain. It's, it's the fact that they get really breathless, particularly after minimal exertion, you know, just walking a little bit and things like that. The chest x-ray you can appreciate in the um, PowerPoint presentation is that it looks, it, it's got some perihilar changes, but it could potentially be normal as well. Um, it looks a lot like COVID, to be honest, and that's why it's one of those things that you need to think about uh, if you start practicing. Patients uh, will be hypoxic. If you have a PaO2 of less than 70, it means you have severe PCP, and that also means that you need to start steroids in addition to cotrimoxazole. Okay, um, so this one tends to come up quite a lot, so it's good to know that one. Um, the other respiratory um, illness that, that HIV patients tend to get is TB. Um, so this is something that most people are fairly uh, familiar with. You get fever, night sweats, cough, hemoptysis, and things like that. Um, just wanted to point out that um, it can be an exam question when they ask you on the CT thorax, you know, what sort of findings would you expect to get? And that's when you pick treen bud appearance. Okay, um, I think I briefly talked about the treatment in the previous lecture. So you have four different types of medications for two months and then two types of medications for another four months. Okay, and this is what it basically looks like. Uh, moving on to um, the tongue. Uh, so candida is something that can happen quite common as well, commonly as well in HIV patients and quite obvious. They tend to just have... Um, a bit of sort of a bit of discomfort really and you don't really need to investigate by scraping it off or sending it off to lab or anything it's a clinical diagnosis um it will be a white coating that you can actually remove if you wanted to and below it you'll see like a, what they describe as a reddish ba base a hyperemic base uh you treat it with oral fluconazole okay and so this is what it looks like uh, moving on to the sort of CNS, sort of the brain system. Uh, so cryptococcal meningitis is something that only occurs if you've got a CD4 count of less than 100. It is a type of yeast and it, you tend to get a subacute sort of presentation as I spoke about earlier, fever, a bit of headache, a bit of um, fatigue as well. Um, people who did the SBAs on Tuesday will remember me mentioning that cryptococcal meningitis always, uh, always typically, well, not 
always typically gives you a really high opening pressure. So on the question on, on, so anything more than, so I think the normal range for um, opening pressure for lumbar puncture is about 20. About, uh, so anything more than that is, should raise alarm, board, uh, alarm bells for that, okay? Treatment is with amphotericin and flucytosin, okay? Um, the other um, CNS infection is toxoplasmosis. So most common, uh, you can you typically get it when your CD4 count is less than 50. Um, I mentioned a bit earlier about how you get focal neurological signs as well. Then with multiple uh, uh, ring enhancing lesions in the brain scan uh, with, um, with a preference for the basal ganglia. I'm not really sure why that's the case, but it's just something that they could use to describe in an SBA question. Okay. Uh, moving on, um, we'll be talking, uh, and this one's PML, so progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It's caused by the JC virus, and it only happens when your CD4 count is really bad as well, less than 50. Um, they typically have a cognitive impairment, um, and when you do a brain scan, you can see sort of hyper intense lesions on the, on the MRI. Okay, the best treatment for this really is to treat the underlying cause of the uh, immunocomp uh, immunocompromise, which is to start um, ARTs for this patient. Okay. Um, CMV retinitis tends to come up quite a bit as well. Um, CD4 count has to be less than 50. Um, you can get any sort of visual symptoms, really, you know, uh, visual loss, floaters, blind spots, um, um, float, um, and, and the kind of um, typical image you get on fundoscopy is actually um, pizza pie. Yeah, and you treat it with gencyclovir or valgencyclovir, okay? Uh, so that's what the fundus should look, could potentially look like. So I just wanted to summarize basically all the different um, slides earlier. So this kind of puts in all the, all the offending organisms and the kind of um, um, clues that give you in the stem, really. The only one that I didn't really mention was uh, disseminated MAC, which is, uh, micro, which is caused by mycobacterium. Um, sort of similar to TB in the sense you get fevers, night sweat, and weight loss. You do get some GI symptoms as well um, with the hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy as well, but that doesn't usually come up for exams, okay? Um, so now we're going to talk a bit, uh, let's try this question, yeah. Give it about a minute. Okay, another 10 seconds. Okay, let's see what everyone thought the correct answer was. Okay, fine. So 58% of people thought it was HIV. Some people thought it could be EBV or herpes zoster as well. Okay, so the correct answer actually is um, HIV. So I'm um, <laughs> HIV talk. Um, let's explain, let's go through the thought process as, as to why that's the correct answer. So herpes simplex um, can cause fever. It can, it doesn't usually cause diarrhea and you would expect the patient to have um, sort of ulcers as well. It could be oral ulcers, genital ulcers. And so it's not quite in keeping with what this patient actually has. Tertiary syphilis, doesn't cause uh, sore throat or diarrhea. So tertiary syphilis usually causes, um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't cause a rash either. So it's not, that's not the right answer. EBV can cause a fever, it can cause sore throat as well. It doesn't usually cause a diarrhea and it can cause a rash, but you might remember it, um, 
it being more typical if you give a patient amoxicillin and then you sort of get this sort of rash around the trunk that's macular papula in nature and that's not quite in keeping with others, what's happened to this patient. Herpes zoster tends to be a dermatomal rash rather than widespread and you wouldn't get um, diarrhea or sore throat either. So I think what this question was trying to show is how non-specific uh, primary HIV infection can be as well, which we'll talk a bit more about in the, ne in the next slide. Um, so these are the sort of typical symptoms you get. Uh, it can be between two to four weeks after you first get inoculated, but most people are asymptomatic or they would have put it off down to be it being a viral fever, really. Um, lots of people can actually go on with, um, with asymptomatic HIV for a long period of time before before their body starts to uh, decompensate with a low CD4 count and high uh, and with high viremia, really. Okay, so so I just wanted to talk a bit more about the kind of things you can see on a patient with HIV. So this could be um, it's a shame it's not interactive, but if we start from you might start if you start from the top left, looking at the rash in this person's hand. This person actually has. Um, papular polymorphic eruption of HIV, okay? So that's um, something you get whether your HIV is well controlled or not. It's quite, it can be quite intensely itchy. The person with the uh, purple lesion here, that should, uh, should be fairly familiar for some people. It's, it's KS, so Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, on the two tongues that you're looking at, so the one towards the middle, that's actually oral candida. The one on the right, that's oral hairy leukoplakia. Okay, and that's called, caused by EV, EBV. Now, I wanted to put that here just to sort of talk briefly about how you can, you can differentiate both of them. You might remember me earlier saying that when you have oral candida, you can actually scrape it off and you would be like a nice red, red base at the bottom. With OHL, oral hairy leukoplakia, you can't actually scrape it off, okay? Um, the bottom left is uh, seborrheic dermatitis, and the lady has lipodystrophy, where you get abnormal distribution of fat around around your limbs, trunk, and face. And on the bottom right, that's genital warts. Okay, so these are some signs you can see in patients with HIV. Okay. Right, let's try this question. Okay, another 10 seconds. Okay, let's see what people thought was the correct answer. Yeah, so perfect. So the major majority of people got it right. 77% of you went for option D, which is correct. Um, smattering of people went for A to E. So let's talk a bit more about... Um, so I'm going to skip A because A is similar to D. So proviral DNA testing um, is a fairly good thought, but it's used mostly for infants who are born to HIV positive mothers. And the reason why you do a proviral DNA test is because you because it's because the mother's antibodies would be um, would be present in the um, the neonate circulation already so by doing an antibody test that wouldn't necessarily give you much uh, accurate information so you just want to check the proviral DNA so that's not the right answer in this question uh, in this question urinary antigen you use it more for patients with legionella uh, which is not quite in keeping with what this patient has uh, you expect someone who has come back from abroad from Spain somewhere with air conditioning or conference and things you expect to have low sodium deranged liver function tests as well influenza swap um, you could potentially do as well but I don't think it should give you um, such a marked 
kind of hypoxia. So between option A and D, the correct answer is actually option D. Uh, and that's because that's the, that's the gold standard at the moment and it makes, gives you the most accurate uh, diagnosis with, uh, with the shortest uh, window period, really. So the current point of care test is fairly accurate within, within sort of four weeks and it tech looks for the, the antigen and the antibody as well. You can, um, it's always important to mention that when you're doing point of care tests, you're actually checking someone's HIV status from about a week, uh, a month or three months ago. Because within, if, they're, if they're infected within four weeks and you're testing them now, you do need to repeat another test in four weeks' time at three months, three months' time just to confirm that they have either seroconverted or not seroconverted. Okay. So this is basically showing a bit about uh, how all the different generations of um, HIV tests. So we've gone all the way to fourth generation, which is antibody and antigen as well. Okay. Right, let's do another diagnosis question. We'll give it about another minute as well. Okay, another 10 seconds. Okay, cool. Let's see. Okay, great. So again, majority of people, 73% uh, of people went for the correct answer, which is actually um, hepatology, uh, starting AR, uh, starting combined antiretroviral therapy, that's what C-A-R-T stands for, and referring them on to uh, see a liver doctor. Now, why is that? Let's talk through what this patient actually has in the first place. So your HCV antibody is reactive, which means, which means that this patient has hepatitis C. Um, the fact that the DNA is detected as well says that it's active hepatitis C infection. Looking at the next three results, you can see that this patient basically is, um, is in keeping with a patient who is vaccinated uh, adequately against hepatitis B. So a, option A is incorrect in this case. Um, the HIV test is positive and the CD4 count is normal. So since this patient is already HIV positive, there's, there's no real need to um, commence post-exposure prophylaxis. The most important thing is to start uh, combined antiretroviral therapy. And the reason why this patient needs to see a, a hepatologist is because this patient has newly diagnosed hepatitis C as well. Uh, some people recall from my talk on Tuesday that hepatitis C, C for chronic, um, most people actually become asymptomatic when they first catch it. And about 75% to 80% of people um, uh, eventually uh, have a chronic state of uh, become a he hepatitis C carrier essentially and that's quite bad because it does accelerate your chance increase your chance of getting cirrhosis uh, hepat hepatocellular carcinoma as well especially if it's co-infected with HIV okay and reassuring discharge is incorrect in this case because you have to do something about this treatment okay so um, so the um, British HIV Association has come up with quite a few different guidelines talking about when you should start um, anti um, uh, HIV medications, basically. And you looking at this list, it might be a bit overwhelming as to why, whether if you need to remember all the different sort of values. And I think the best way to summarize it is with this slide, actually, which basically has, which basically says that if you're not sure and the patient is willing to start taking medication, just start the therapy basically, because there has been good evidence that shows there's no point waiting for your CD4 count to drop or blah, 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 that sort of thing. 
just start it as long as they're happy to start taking it. Um, sometimes when patients are newly diagnosed with HIV, they do need time to process um, the feelings and sort of, you know, all the stigma surrounding it as well. So it might, it doesn't have to be started immediately, but as soon as they're ready to start taking it, they should start taking it on a long-term basis, okay? Right, next question. Okay, about 10 seconds left. Okay, time's up. Let's see. Right. Okay, so correct answer is option B, yeah prescribing post-exposure prophylaxis. I think it's quite important to point out that in truth, you would probably do um, a few different, you would probably do option B and option D as well. Um, it's all things that you would sort of check just to make sure that he doesn't actually already have HIV. So um, determining the HIV status of partners uh, is not really necessary at this point. As, soon, as long as you've had receptive anal sex, you should be, and, and you're concerned about HIV, you should be given PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. Referral to a HIV clinic is inappropriate because you can actually give, um, because any delay could lead to potential harm to the patient. Uh, reassuring and discharging the patient is in, inappropriate in this case as well. Okay, um, so some vague, some, some, it's good to have a thought process on the different types of um, uh, sexual practices that can lead to a patient needing post exposure prophylaxis. But lot, um, broadly speaking, um, they need to have post exposure prophylaxis within 72 hours. There, and they'll be given rotegravir and Truvada, which are, which uh, you need to take for 28 days. So it's quite a commitment, really. You do so. So how do we decide which patients need it? So PEP can be either recommended, not recommended, or considered. So as long as the person has had receptive anal sex, it is recommended. If, if, if you've had oral sex without ejaculation, you don't actually need, um, it's not recommended to have PEP at all. All the, all the other sort of acts in between, are, is, it sort of states that PEP is considered. Okay. Um, you don't, as I said earlier, you don't really need to know the nitty gritty per se, but I think it's good to know some specific ones. Um, so if it comes up in question, you can sort of get the, get the correct answer for that. So um, this is where it comes from. So if you've had receptive anal intercourse, um, you have the highest risk amongst all these different sexual acts. If you've had insertive oral sex without uh, any ejaculation, um, there, there's a study that says that basically the percentage of catching the chance of getting HIV is zero. So that's why you don't actually need PEP. So you just sort of need to know the extremes and then you can sort of guess what goes in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk, I wanted to spend some time talking about some AIDS defining conditions. And I think that's, um, I put the ones in red, uh, um, I highlighted some in red because those are the ones that tend to come up in, in the, in finals or, um, exams and things like that. So candidiasis of the esophagus uh, and anything further down is an AIDS defining illness. It is not oral candida. So that's something that you need to differentiate in your head. Cervical cancer, cryptococcal, um, cryptosporidium, these are all the kind of things that can, if you see it in a patient, it's an AIDS defining illness. Okay. And this is a kind of nice summary slide talking about all the different systems and how, and how HIV can predispose them to having certain types of infection as well. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is just something you can have a look um, just to organize your thoughts at some point. Okay. Um, 
A, it's defining cancers, malignancies. That's quite important to know. So there are three types that you need to know. So KS, Kaposi's coma, um, uh, any high-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, such as C CNS lymphoma, which was the first question we're talking about, CNS primary lymphoma, and also invasive cervical cancer. These are the three AIDS-defining malignancy. Of course, having HIV does increase your chance of getting cancer in the first place, um, but they are non-AIDS-defining cancers, such as Hodgkin's lymphoma or anal cancer. Okay. I've made a nice little summary slide on um, all the different kind of um, non-infectious risk uh, that they can have. Um, so they can, you can see that they actually have an increased cerebral vascular risk, increased risk of having strokes, increased chance of having cancers and things like that as well. Okay, so something you can sort of look at during your own time. Okay, let's talk a bit more about gum now then. Okay, so we give this about a minute, I think. This should be enough. Okay, about 10 seconds left. Yep. Okay, so I think that's enough time. Let's see what people thought. Okay, so yeah, so 60% of people went for option E, uh, but close to 30% of people went for option B. Okay, fine. And the correct answer actually is um, gonorrhea vagina, vaginalis. And the reason why that's the correct answer is, um, is because this patient actually has what we call BV, so bacterial vaginosis. And the reason why you know that is because this patient, uh, there's a few telltale signs that you get with that. People that would typically have fishy odor. It can be related to um, it being during the, menses, uh, the menstrual period as well. Uh, looking at E. coli, that's not the correct answer because that is the most, even though that's the most common cause for a urinary tract infection, this patient doesn't really uh, have symptoms that's in keeping with it. Okay. Uh, Trichomonas vaginalis is a good thought process as well, um, but it's not really quite in keeping with the sort of fishy odor. You tend to get sort of frothy kind of discharge and lots of it. And there usually is some sort of previous sex, uh, sexual contact as well, which is not stated in this question. Canada uh, for C and D, uh, that's not quite in keeping with it. You tend to get sort of curt like discharge, more sort of vulva irritation and pain, uh, dyspareunia and things like that. So I've put that all in a slide here. In the top right-hand corner, you can see trichomonas, and that's a protozoa that has um, that basically yeah causes uh, things like that. So you, you can see that the patient has um, uh, so the WIF test is basically where you add potassium hydroxide. Yeah, KOH, potassium hydroxide, and it gives off sort of, sort of fishy odor, which is what the question was alluding to. Sometimes they will say that they, when you've done, done a wet mount of the uh, sample, you can see clue cells as well. So that's a kind of giveaway for BV. Uh, candidiasis, you typically get it in patients with diabetes. And trichomonas, usually, you, you can, when you do the wet mount, you can actually see the protozoa in it as well. And it can be related to a patient having a strawberry cervix as well. Okay, so these are the sort of um, main differences, which I thought was quite good to highlight uh, just in terms of revision, really. Um, other causes of discharge, uh, back to my favorite stuff, toys, chlamydia and gonorrhea. So chlamydia is a um, obligate intracellular bacterium, which makes it, um, <clears throat> which means that it's very difficult to culture, it's difficult to pick up as well. Um, lots of people have no symptoms at all, but if you do have symptoms, you would have some form of discharge or dysuria. 
Okay. Um, neonates obviously tend to get more pneumonia from, from chlamydia or conjunctivitis. Uh, you diagnose it by look, doing the uh, nucleic acid amplification test and you treat them with doxycycline or azithromycin. Okay. Gonorrhea is a gram-negative diplococcus. Um, similar to chlamydia, really, you get discharged, dysuria, sometimes you get some inguinal involvement as well. Women sometimes will have their, some of the glands involved downstairs and the best way and the problem with gonorrhea is that it can, it's it's um it's come to the point where it's res getting more resistance to certain antibiotics really and that's the reason why you need to give them ceftriaxone and azithromycin um just to cover for any potential co-infections as well okay right so let's try another question on discharge this one probably about 45 seconds should be about enough yeah. Okay, another 10 seconds. Okay, let's see. Right, so most of pe most people went for option E, which is clotrimosol um, pessary, which is the correct answer, actually. So this patient has a candida infection, and you would straight away know. So let's talk through the different options now. So... Option A, clindamycin, is a good treatment for patients with BV, um, but that's not quite in keeping in this case because there's no fishy odor, things like that. It's sort of white discharge, isn't it? Um, we'll skip option B for now. Let's go on to option C. So option C is a good treatment for chlamydia. Again, not quite in keeping with overall what's happening with this patient. Um, the fact that the patient is not sexually active as well um, points towards something else that's causing her symptoms. Reassuring this patient and discharging her is not quite appropriate because she is having symptoms and it's good to treat that as well. So option B and E, they're both treatments for genital candidiasis. Um, but the correct answer is E because this is her first time having this and, and it's sort of a localized infection. If a patient has had recurrent sort of um, candidiasis that's when you go to oral nystatin instead okay so that's what candida looks like it's as as we mentioned earlier it's sort of um associated with people uh in, with conditions that lead to immunosuppression so if you had antibiotic use you have poorly controlled diabetes immunosuppression that's where you that increases your chance of getting candida uh, infections downstairs. Uh, you, women tend to get itch, some discharge and dysuria as well, pain while having sex. Men would just have itch, soreness and redness as well. And this is something that uh, tends to come up uh, in exams and which is that the most common cause of candida is actually candida albicans, okay? Right, so next question. Okay, another 10 seconds, I think. Okay, sure, I think that should be enough time for people to come to the right answer. And okay, fine. So most people went, so most people went for option B, 65% uh, of people went for HSV2, uh, followed by HSV1, and nobody thought C or E was the correct answer. Fine. Um, the correct answer is HSV1. Now, 
people might be I can see <laughs> I can see people wondering why that's the case in the first place. So typically you would have learned from textbooks that uh, HSV1 causes oral um, uh, lesions and HSV2 causes genital lesions. Now that, that historically was true and to more recent times when, when sort of sexual, uh, sex, sexual practices have changed uh, involving more oral sex essentially. So it's a pure numbers game at this point and the correct answer is actually hsv1 unfortunately so that's sorry it's a bit annoying isn't it um hiv doesn't cause genital lesions um syphilis which is option d can cause um a painless solitary rash but it shouldn't cause genital lesions like that as well uh chlamydia again doesn't cause genital lesions either okay so this one's bit annoying, bit tricky, but at least you know now because of more oral sex now, essentially HSV1 goes everywhere. Okay, let's try another question, this one. Uh, I'm aware of people asking questions in the chat. I'll just sort of address all of them towards the end. That's okay with people, yeah? So you just keep them coming and I'll address them towards the end. Okay, 10 seconds left. Okay, let's see. So, okay, 63% of people went for option A, and then some people went for option D and E as well. Okay, so fine. Uh, the correct answer is option A. So abstaining from any sexual activity into the asymptomatic. Um, so this patient basically has uh, herpes, or well, he's had herpes before. And as, you probably, um, as you're probably aware, herpes is the gift that keeps on giving. So you get it and then it goes away, it comes back again, you know, it just keeps coming back. And what actually happens is that this patient is having sort of prodromal symptoms leading, preceding another recurrence of herpes. And that basically means that he could become infectious at that point. And that's why you want to abstain from any sexual activity until the lesions have healed over because that's when the virus stops shedding. Continuing without any, any contraception, that's inappropriate. Abstaining from um, option C is just a bit harsh. Uh, option D is treatment for gonorrhea or chlamydia. Uh, option E is it's not quite enough to stop someone from catching herpes in the first place. Okay, so the correct answer is to wait for the, your lesions or to heal over or for you to become asymptomatic before you can be sexually active again. So this is a sort of summary slide. Um, so herpes, uh, two different sorts of herpes up there. Um, they can, as mentioned earlier, they're the most common cause of causing painful genital ulcers that come and go. Um, you don't usually need to treat them, but if you do need to treat them um, with anything, it's with oral acyclovir. And the recurrent episodes, you don't actually really need to um, give anything more than that. It's just sort of self-limiting, really. To really diagnose this, you have to go to the... Uh, lesion sort of swab the bottom of the swab uh swab the bottom of the ulcer really and look for dna the herpes dna and, and that's how you get sort of definitive kind of um, diagnosis for this patient okay so that's what herpes looks like um we're just going to talk a bit about the sort of differential diagnosis so other than herpes uh you can um other infections that can cause multiple genital ulcers are belenitis uh, of which the most likely causes are candida and trichomonas as well okay chancroid uh, is cause it's very rare really but it's the kind of thing that would come up in an sba really it's, it's someone who's probably come back from abroad someone from sub-saharan africa or asia this patient would have would would be telling you that it started out with with a little papule that became pus filled and it's become um now it's quite painful in this sort of in this lymphadenopathy as well it's 
usually it's, it's caused by Haemophilus ducreae, and that's something to think about. It's not very important, but it's some sort of differential diagnosis that you think about. I've not seen it myself, actually. Some dermatological conditions can cause multiple genital ulcers as well, and infestations uh, can cause this sort of symptoms too. So going on to the flip side, if you have a person with a single genital ulcer and um, it's the, your first thought should be primary syphilis. Shankara, they are a single uh, painless or indurated ulcer that you get on genitals. But some other good, uh, some other um, differential diagnosis you need to think about uh, includes any sort of cancer, any sort of reactive arthritis, or um, or the next two ones as well, which are quite rare. So LGV is caused by chlamydia, trachomatis, but it's caused by specific subtypes of chlamydia, so L1 to 3. These patients typically have been abroad, sort of the same areas I mentioned before. They tend to be men who have sex with men. They, can ha they would have um, painful unilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy, which is known as bubos, and they can get anal rectal syndrome, syndromes as well, where they can get um, lots of mucus discharge, pain on defecating, or blood coming up from the back end. Um, there's another illness that's quite rare as well, which is similar to LGV, is called granuloma inguinale, which is caused by Klebsiella granulomatis. It's a single, uh, it's a single ulcer that's painless, so similar to syphilis, but this patient will probably have been abroad, it's quite rare, and it's, it's progressive as opposed to what syphilis does. Syphilis, you just get a single ulcer that goes away over time. That's it. That's why many people miss it. Right. Let's, speaking of syphilis, let's try this question. <laughs> Okay, another 10 seconds left. Okay, perfect. Let's see what people thought. Okay, all right, so fairly, sp so there's a bit of a split, isn't it? 39% of people went for C, 30% of people went for A, Okay, um, so this is a bit tricky actually. So the correct answer actually is C. Um, I think most people will realize that this patient has, um, has a Yarish Herxheimer reaction, which happens when uh, someone who with primary syphilis is given um, a penicillin, basically treated. Um, the way, the, the correct answer is, um, if this patient is actually well, and largely asymptomatic other than just say fever, you could actually just reassure them and discharge them with symptomatic medications. However, this patient has come in with some tachycardia, slightly, um, you know, some borderline hypotension as well. So I think that's what this question was trying to point at, that this patient will need some fluid resuscitation as well. Um, going on to option B, azithromycin is a treatment for chlamydia, which is not quite appropriate for this patient, doesn't be needed. Corticosteroids have, uh, are not indicated in, in patients with yarish herxheimer reaction, and penicillin is probably just going to make things worse, really, okay? So syphilis, we're just going to talk, we, I like to break it down into two different sections, uh, two different parts really. So early syphilis and late syphilis. So primary and secondary, secondary syphilis uh, are sort of classified under early, uh, early syphilis within a year. Late syphilis is usually tertiary syphilis, okay? And the way, and I just thought this is sort of a summary slide of what, what you need to know about syphilis really. So primary syphilis, you get the um, painless genital lesion on an indurated base, uh, and which goes away over time and people hardly notice it really. Secondary syphilis is where patients usually seek treatment because they'll get this 
massive rash going across their trunk, hands, limbs that is not itchy at all. So they'll say, look, there's all these things going on, but it's not itchy, there's nothing else going. Sometimes they do get some fever, a bit of fatigue as well, but that's not so common. Okay. Tertiary syphilis is um, something that can, that can be a medical emergency. They can cause sort of inflammation in lots of different places and cause it in your blood vessels. So you get aortitis, you get neurological symptoms as well with uh, tapes, dorsalis, where you get sort of demyelination parts of your brain, sort of eye manifestations as well. Um, it's important to note as well that neurosyphilis and ocular syphilis can actually occur at any stage of, of, of your infection. So it doesn't have to just be tertiary syphilis. It can be primary or secondary as well. Okay. And that's what you, that's the kind of rash you get in a patient with secondary syphilis. Yeah. So I was talking a bit earlier about the Yarish Herxheimer reaction, and this is something that we, and that's basically where there's bacteria in your body, you're giving the penicillin to kill all this bacteria, the bacteria dies, releasing lots of, um, releasing all the endotoxins that cause this inflammatory response. Okay, and so usually you can just monitor it with sort of NSAIDs or paracetamol, but if it's a bit more serious, like a person who is a bit more hemodynamically unstable, you will need to give them some fluids as well. Okay. Right. This is the last question now. Give you about, I don't think you need that much time for this one, about 40 seconds. Yeah. Okay, another 10 seconds. All right, let's see. Right, yeah, so more than half of you got the correct answer, which is to do a pregnancy test, essentially. Um, that's, so this patient, so any, any young female, comes in with abdominal pain and uh, the most important thing is to uh, to first rule out an ectopic pregnancy okay and the best way to do that is by doing by going ahead with option b um just wanted to finish this talk by talking a bit about pid pelvic inflammatory disease it sort of basically is an ascending uh, infection basically it starts in the vagina it goes through the surface up to the upper genital tract uh, it's usually due to a sexually transmitted infection but sometimes you just don't know what's causing it um, the patient usually have abdominal pain discharge some bleeding after having sex as well the the most important thing you need to do is do your pelvic exam first do a pregnancy test to rule out any ectopic uh, pregnancy because that could be a surgical emergency you, need, you can then investigate by looking for common organisms such as chlamydia and gonorrhea and doing some transfer vaginal ultrasound as well which is what the other options were um, qu it's quite uncommon for people to have this but some people have the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome where you get inflammation of the right upper quadrant um, I've not seen that in real life either okay um, that's basically what we want to cover today I'm just going to go through, go to the chat to see what people were asking for. So I'll just start with a Q and A first. Okay, so C A R T is combined antiretroviral therapy or anti retroviral treatment. Um, what was the condition in question one? So that's CNS primary lymphoma, which is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, making it uh, one of the AIDS defining um, conditions. Okay. JC virus. So JC virus is the, is it the, I think it stands for is it John Cunningham virus. I think, uh, don't quote me on that, but it's a type of virus. I think it's, it's a polyoma virus that uh, can either occur in someone who's immunosuppressed or if you've received certain sort of immunomodulators such, such as uh, natalizumab, which causes um, this sort of syndrome. Okay. Uh, when do these signs appear? Oh, you're talking about the, um, so it can appear in uh, uh, anyone with HIV, really. It doesn't have to be sort of end stage or AIDS sort of signs. 
uh, on what question, what part of the question suggests is HIV is, I think that's the question on the, on the returning traveler. So yeah, so it's, so HIV primary infection is quite non-specific and that's why lots of time is sort of missed really. You can get symptoms of fever, sore throat, rash, um, sort of lymphadenopathy as well. Um, you can also get diarrhea in this patient. So I think overall looking at the, the uh, different organisms, uh, HIV is the most uh, likely one. Plus the fact that he's been abroad, a bit more suggestive of some of him possibly going somewhere exotic and catching it. Okay. Um, right. Um, when lipodystrophy is actually, oh, that's a good question. Actually, someone's asking if it's due to HIV or due to medication. Actually, it's due to both. Um, so that's that's the correct answer. That's, that's the honest answer. Why do we test for HIV at four weeks and then at three months? So it's basically to, um, so you do it first. And then you know you had a window period of four weeks, but um, there is still a um, what do we call it? the sensitivity is not hundred percent. So where where essentially I think sort of like ninety five percent of people, if they have seroconverted, they would have ser seroconverted within um, uh, four weeks, and then a greater percentage of people were seroconverted by three weeks, uh, by three months, really. So that's why you do it at four weeks and three months, just to do, just to check and make sure, yeah. Okay, what does it mean by AIDS defining? Oh, so AIDS. Oh, sorry. So I sort of skimmed through, skim past that one. AIDS defining is basically a condition that occurs in a patient with, um, typically with a CD4 count less than uh, 200, essentially. So that's where you get things like PCP, you get things like candidiasis, uh, or, well, um, yeah, candidiasis and things like that as well. What is the significance of the cervical ectropion in BV? It's just a red herring, actually. So I think what that was trying to lead people to think that it's a strawberry cervix that you get in Trichomonas uh, vaginalis instead. Okay. Can candida pass from men to women? Not typically. So candida infections are not typically a sort of uh, sexually transmitted infection. So I don't think that's the case, really. Do you always get gonorrhea with, I don't care, okay, give an oral regime. Um, I think the best practice is actually to give cataraxone and azithromycin. I think you would almost certainly have to give that oral regime. No, I don't know. I don't really know. I mean, I know of some people who have sort of um, penicillin allergy and they have to take something else but it essentially becomes a very high dose of um, azithromycin and people just puke and things like that. Yeah, so I think that's not really helpful. How do we know if the cause is changing? Oh, okay, so so I think it, I think if classically they're talking about um, if the person has like oral ulcers and things like that, you would go for HSV1. Um, if you have any lesions, genital lesions, it'll be HSV2. But as mentioned earlier, the question was asking what is the most likely organism, which is a simple numbers game, which is HSV1 being more commonly in for, for everything now, essentially. Okay. Uh, fine. Uh, what would you do for the next investigation swab or TVUS? I think the correct answer would be both. Actually, you would do both. I uh, wouldn't necessarily know the order of which one's better than which. How do you differentiate anaphylaxis from James Trard? Do you have a potential for this operation? Yeah, uh, I think that's a good point. Um, so anaphylaxis would um, you typically you typically you can get sort of tachycardia and hypotension as well uh, with hemodynamic compromise, but you would also typically also have sort of a, you can also have sort of um, mucosal involvement, so like you know yeah, sort of swelling, you know, closing up with the airway and things like that, and that's what that's what. Um, that's what sort of pointing you away from anaphylaxis, if that makes sense. Uh, does fit be a good extra management or do you just, I think, I don't know the answer to that actually for Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Sorry about that. Um, learning resources, practice, I said happy. Uh, <laughs> I guess the correct answer would be you could, you could go quest med <laughs> to get some questions on that. <laughs> yeah. Mm. KS is appears in vision. Let's see what the vision is. Well, I mean, so so sorry, sorry. Uh, well, Kaposi subcoma is an AIDS-defining cancer. Yeah. Mm. Okay. 
What was the name of the distribution of fat? So that's lipodystrophy, uh, mentioned a bit earlier. Um, I think people will be putting up the uh, lectures online at some point as well. Um, how to get into gum medicine. So I think people who have to, I think you have to do core medical training first. Uh, so you do F1, F2, you go to core medical training and then you apply to do your sort of um, specialization in gum as well. Any good resources? Quest, Quest Med. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I was going to stay back for a bit.